Let us pray. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were given up to the will of your persecutors, suffered many torments when they took off the purple robe, which was stuck to your wounds, and put upon you your own clothes. Grant that after I have put off the clothing of this body, I may be clad with the robe of perfect charity, and that I may be adorned with your merit, and through your mercy be introduced as an adopted son into the heavenly inheritance. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who in the midst of reproach and injury bore your cross with excessive pain on your sacred and cut shoulders. Wearied and panting for breath, you toiled exceedingly under its heavy weight. Give me grace to take hold of the cross of self-denial with ardent devotion, and to imitate with the most fervent of charity the example of your virtues, and to follow you in humility even unto death. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when you were led from the city with two thieves, did not refuse to be pressed upon and thrust, hastened and to be afflicted in many ways. Draw me after you, that I may quickly follow. Grant that for your sake I may entirely deny, forsake, and go out of myself. Give me grace to think of you alone and to find no joy except in you, my Redeemer. Grant that I may love you alone and may return love for love. May I earnestly seek after you and live to you alone. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when bowed down by the weight of your cross, at length reached the place of punishment, where, offered e quite exhausted, they offered you wine mingled with gall. May you extinguish in me all gluttonous and carnal desire, giving me grace never to consent to any impure or unlawful pleasure. But may I take my food in moderation, to the glory of your name, and may hunger and thirst after you alone, and find no pleasure or gladness except in you. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who was stripped before the gaze of all people on Mount Calvary, and the soreness of your wounds being increased by the removal of your clothing. You did not refuse to undergo for my sake the most dreadful pain, Grant that I may love the spirit of poverty and never be disturbed by want or scarcity. Give me grace to bear patiently any difficulties or troubles in this life for the glory of your name. Strip my heart of every vain fancy and affection and grant me a holy intent with pious desires, renewing within me daily a most pure love for yourself. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who gave himself up to be extended naked upon the wood of the cross and the joints of your most holy limbs to be wrenched apart, most cruelly nailed and fastened thereto. Then for my sake you suffered your most delicate hands and feet to be most deeply wounded. Grant, O Lord, that I might remember with a faithful and grateful heart, this your unspeakable charity, when you did of your own accord stretch out your hands to be bored and your feet to be pierced through. O Lord, enlarge and extend my heart by a perfect love of you. Pierce it and fix it to yourself with the nail of your sweetest love, and shut up within yourself alone all my senses, all my thoughts and all my affections. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
Reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 21. When Jesus had come into the temple, the chief priests and those in authority over the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them in answer, I will put one question to you, and if you give me the answer, I will say by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from men? Well, they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Then why didn't you have faith in him? But if we say from men, we are in fear of the people, because all take John to be a prophet. So they made answer and said, We have no idea. Then he said to them, Then I will not say to you by what authority I do these things. But how does it seem to you? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vine garden. He said in answer, I will not. But later, changing his decision, he went. He came to the second and said the same. And he made answer and said, I go, and went not. Which of the two did his father's pleasure? They say, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that tax farmers and loose women are going into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you had no faith in him. For the tax farmers and the loose women had faith in him. And you, when you saw it, did not even have regret for your sins, so as to have faith in him. Listen to another story. A master of a house made a vine garden, put a wall around it, and made a place for crushing the wine, and made a tower, and let it out to field workers, and went to live in another country. When the time for the fruit came near, he sent his servants to the workmen to get the fruit. But the workmen made an attack on his servants, giving blow to ones, putting another to death, and stoning another. Again he sent other servants, more in number than the first, and they did the same to them. But after that he sent his own son to them, saying, They will have respect for my son. But when the workmen saw the son, they said to themselves, This is he who will one day be the owner of the property. Come, let us put him to death and take the heritage. And so they took him, and driving out of the, him out of the vine garden, put him to death. When then the Lord of the vine garden returns, what will he do to those workmen? They said to him, He will put those cruel men to a cruel death and will let out the vine garden to other workmen, who will give him the fruit when it is ready. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the writings the stone which the builders put on one side? The same has been made the chief stone of the building. This was the Lord's doing, and it is a wonder in our eyes. For this reason, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing the fruits of it. Any man falling on this stone will be broken, but he on whom it comes down upon will be crushed to death. When his stories came to the ears of the chief priests and the Pharisees, they understood that he was talking about them, and though they had a desire to take him, they were in fear of the people, because in their eyes he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus was no stranger to controversy. From the first debates over the law in the temple, the age of twelve, through the course of his ministry, to this point recorded here by Matthew shortly before his death. It is something to which we should become accustomed ourselves as his followers because there will always be a queue of those anxious to frustrate our message, attempting to score points, or generally embarrass us. 
Indeed, Jesus simply could not keep away from the temple, even though it was full of danger for him. The previous day he had purged the temple of all cheating traders, who had preyed upon the faithful who came to offer sacrifices and to pray, courting the adverse attention of the authorities. Again, first thing in the morning, no less, he had returned for a second encounter. The previous day he had called the temple a house of prayer, and in the instance today he was preaching. This makes an interesting association for us, that it is not possible to preach without prayer, or indeed to pray without preaching. At the same time it is necessary to enjoy the word as this praying. The two activities are totally inseparable. Menaced by the chief priests and their acolytes, Jesus was gravely insulted by their arrogance and their ignorance. Had they stopped for just a moment, considering the miracles that Jesus had performed, together with the clarity and the sincerity of his preaching, they would have realised he had more than any mortal authority. Indeed, Nicodemus, who was one of these leaders, had acknowledged Jesus as a man of God, but these, filled completely with envy and malice, were unwilling and unable to consider any such evidence. As ever, Jesus had the perfect response in the quiet question that he posed to his accusers. What did they consider John's authority to be? Finding themselves trapped by Jesus, they declined to answer. In their arrogance, they could not or would not speak the words of the blindingly obvious, at least as far as the crowd was concerned. Had they acknowledged John, they would have been obliged to acknowledge Jesus, for the evidence that Jesus, for Jesus was far more compelling than that for John. Jesus went on to issue a stern warning to the Jews in the parable of the vineyard and its owner. The vineyard is, of course, the promised land, heaven, and the owner is God, who prepared it for his people to live in. The tenants that Jesus referred to are the children of Abraham, the inheritors of the promise that God made with him, Isaac and Jacob. The slaves that were said to collect his portion of the harvest were his prophets. After their captivity in Egypt, the Israelites were led by Moses and Joshua into the Promised Land, a land that God had given to Abraham many years previously as his promised inheritance. The land was rich, flowing with milk and honey, as we read in Exodus 3.8. What was the tenancy agreement, we ask? God issued Moses with a contract, summed up in the Ten Commandments which outlined the principles of behaviour which he demanded from his people, together with other requirements detailing how he would be worshipped. This, as we know, they failed to do, not just once, but over and over and over again. Prophet after prophet was sent to warn the people of the error of their ways and of the consequences of their sins. Sometimes they would take notice for a short while, but much of the time they were given little attention. One only has to read through the second book of Kings to discover a long list of those kings who dishonoured God and the very few who kept his laws. So, as a result, the Israelites were led away into captivity. Many were to learn the error of their ways and were allowed to return home, only to forget what they had learnt and to receive return back into a life of sin. So in the end, God had no choice but to send his Son. It is easy to read this passage and to feel complacent. These were criticisms of a people 2,000 years ago, and the mistakes that they made are blindingly obvious to us. However, there is a serious danger that we too are at this very moment making similar mistakes. When we suffer, we turn our thoughts to God. But when the good times come around, 
We tend to forget all about him and think only of ourselves. This point was brought home to me a few years ago after the terrorist attacks in Paris, when on the television I saw the massed crowds outside the Cathedral of Notre Dame in a prayer vigil for those killed. Suddenly there were tens of thousands of Parisians who believed in God. From whence had they come? Why had we never seen them before in Notre Dame? This parable should make us all feel uneasy about our faith. How much do we love God? What is our faith to us? Why do we go to church? How can we keep that love that we had for Jesus when we first became a Christian? Have we allowed it to become dull over the years, or does it still burn brightly in our hearts? Jesus does not ask a great deal from us. Just that we love him and the Father above all else, and our neighbour as ourselves. That is what we owe him today. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, that they may obtain their petitions, make them ask such things as will please you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.